Dag Hessen. Ja, yeah, I'm going back to Lamarck's reason to bring him on the stage. It's not only from an evolutionary point of view. Yeah, Lamarck again. <laughs> But uh, with another perspective, uh, I mean, we are surrounded, as you say, and this is an important to topic of your book, by plastics, toxins of all kinds, radiation and all this, which definitely might be one of the uh, key drivers for uh, methylation and uh, epigenetic modifications, which of course is very risky because we don't really know much about it. But if this is something that uh, eventually weakens off and fades off through a couple of generations, then it's something that might be reversed, and that's, I think, a very critical question. I mean, it, it won't be like a mutation that will stay on, at least not a germ cell mutation that will stay on and be passed on to the next generations. So um, that's why I, I wonder if you have some ideas about the, the reversibility of this and whether it fade, fades off after a couple of generations or it might eventually be passed on to infinity. Now, the, most of the evidence so far suggests that with each generation there's a, a weakening of the effect. So um, although there are some studies, I think it's in worms, they managed to see an effect up to 10 generations or so. In general, it, it's weakening. And you, uh, most studies show, you know, by about the third or fourth generation, it's pretty much gone back to where it was. So it looks like this Lamarckian inheritance, this soft inheritance, was just meant to last three or four generations, presumably until that environment had changed. So that is, in, I mean, it depends, it's reversible across a sort of family lifespan, but, but uh, we now know that it, it's hard to generalize. There are some genes that are perhaps switching all the time and are rather unstable, and if you measure them, you know, a few days later, they'll have changed. Others will stay stable, perhaps for your lifetime, and perhaps the majority might be changing over 10 years or so. So it, it's, it's hard at the moment to generalize about this, but we do know, I mean, the exciting thing is that you know, if something happens, it has to be reversible. And the fact that we change so much from birth to death also means that that process is potentially reversible. Sisampus? Uh, I have a question related to in, in vitro fertilization, IVF. And uh, you mention in your book that uh, you are question, uh, questioning and look with curiosity about what would be the long-term effect, for instance, in the epigenetic way. I would like to hear your comments here because that also happened when Sir Winston was here. Uh, and he being one of the fathers of IVF, he had exactly the same a bit um, uh, anxious uh, relation to the epigenetic factors here. Thank you. Okay, um, so Dolly the sheep was the first sort of IVF uh, famous mammal, and um, she died uh, prematurely, had arthritis and lung problems way ahead of her normal lifespan. And although I don't think she'd been tested particularly for epigenetics, uh, the idea was that th this was one of the reasons that compared to her clone, uh, she didn't do very well. And there are a, a number of indirect studies suggesting that uh, anything you do to um, an embryo or a fetus that uh, is manipulating it differently is at a, such a sensitive time is going to have an effect, a very subtle effect, that so far hasn't been noticed as far as we know, up to about the age of 30. But animal studies suggest that it's more the aging process. So developmentally, they're, you know, they're showing a few more uh, mutations and problems, but they're generally fairly rare, IVF kids. Uh, but um, <coughs> my reading of the subject was that uh, we are going to expect uh, a level of problems uh, perhaps minor, hopefully minor ones, but th there will be those involved. And as soon as we start using anything artificial, we are interfering with the normal differentiation of cells, which are highly responsive to their environment. And so it would be unreasonable not to expect some differences between IVF kids and uh, normal births. We're doing some twin studies at the moment where we have identical twins 
um, to look at the differences between identical IVF twins and uh, uh, identical natural twins. And we should have those results um, within the next six months, so maybe it'll answer that. But I think it, it's a fascinating and slightly worrying question. That, um, so far, that nothing major has turned up, but lots of little bits of evidence um, about how these, you know, and also the, you've got to remember the genetics of people who need IVF are different. So it could be that the, the, uh, the sperm of the father or the egg of the mother has some epigenetic uh, defects, if you like, that meant they were less likely to be fertile that are being passed on. So these kids could also be less fertile through epigenetic mechanisms. I wanted to bring up a very different issue about the, the future of research on, on epigenetics. And you have a great resource in UK Twins, and you've been using that in your presentation and your book. We have developed resources in Norway based on large cohorts, particularly the mother and child cohort, where we have blood samples and questionnaire data from early in pregnancy, both from mothers and fathers, and cord blood, and where we follow up both children and their parents, more than 100,000 children and their parents, for as long as they're willing to participate. And that has also been the source of a large population-based biobank, and it can be linked to national health registries. So. Uh, since, in my view, epigenetics is at a very early stage where it's not clear exactly how important it is, uh, what, uh, to what extent epigenetic changes are heritable over generations, uh, and to what extent that explains how genes and environment work together, I think that such resources will be extremely important in following up on what you've told us about today. And I would like to hear your and perhaps others' comments on how you think we can use those resources and, and to what extent they are important for epigenetic research in the future. I, I think they're absolutely crucial collecting these, these large uh, population-based um, resources. Family-based is important because what we've, we've found is that we can do epigenetic studies in twins that you just cannot do in uh, the population. So we do a little study of 20 pairs and find more interesting results than studies of thousands of uh, unrelated individuals because it's a, epigenetics has a genetic basis, so each family is going to have a different response, if you like, because of their, partly because of their genes. So collecting little nuclear families is, is, is the way to go. And multi-generational studies are absolutely vital. We've got to start collecting DNA at multiple time points in life. Collect it from the right place. You can't use, you know, um, buckle smears and things like this. Unfortunately, they don't give good results. So collecting it from the right tissue, banking it, is absolutely vital. And, um, you know, these things need to be started now. I mean, when I started, people laughed at me because I collected DNA at more than one time point. I couldn't get grants. They said, well, cut, cross that off your grant. Your DNA never changes. That was a stupid thing to do, you idiot. No, but um, I, as most researchers do, ignored the reviewers' comments, and uh, you, you collected, and luckily I did. But many cohorts don't have any data like that. And, and I, I would uh, like to add to that, we also need to collect information on environmental exposures at many different time points, and yeah. particularly early in life. Yeah. But, but, of course, throughout the life course. But I think the, the epigenome might be the way to detect these exposures, because actually we can do that. We can measure 20 million sites on one individual and see how they're changing. Much more sensitive, perhaps, than, than the, the rather crude assays we have for measuring uh, toxins. So the time is flying. Uh, we have to round up. Uh, Doug wants to comment, and then Axel and Sisa. Sorry. Again, bringing up uh, a different topic, although you have touched upon it. I mean, some people believe that epigenetics might be a hype. Uh, I don't. I think it's important, although I think nobody can so far tell how important it will be. But uh, what we really know is the, how our microbial uh, 
uh, internal fellows really affect our uh, not only uh, somatic uh, well-being, but also probably the psychological to a large extent. So this goes to the use of antibiotics, which in many cases might be simply to reboot the whole microbial community. Uh, have you something to say about this? Should this mean that we should have more, be more cautious about using, even more cautious uh, with using antibiotics? And can we believe that the, the community will recolonize itself as probably much as it was before, or do we simply change the biodiversity inside of ourselves? Um, I think antibiotics are really important. Um, the average 18-year-old now has had 20 courses of antibiotics in most of Northern Europe. 20 courses, and most of them are unnecessary. Uh, obviously, they save lives, and so uh, we need to balance that. But it's quite possible that some of the changes to other diseases of, since, since 1945, when antibiotics started being used, could be attributed to our increase in use of these and a change in our gut flora. Now, the, the actual data on what changes with antibiotics in gut flora is very weak. It's still you know, very small scale. We don't really know about whether, you know, you just change those near the, 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 surf, near, near the surface and you don't change the central one. So I don't think we completely change our gut flora, but we change certain of them. Certain of them get wiped out and it's not clear whether they completely regrow. Because we, but these studies are ongoing. So they're taking, we can remember we start life with no bacteria at all. We're completely sterile when we, um, when we come out of, the out of the womb. And it takes seven years to build up what is your likely pattern for your life. And I think this is really exciting about what we're going to do with this. And I think studying antibiotics could end up you know, in, uh, being absolutely crucial and combating them. Uh, you know, could explain many of these unexplained um, changes in our diseases. Is so, it? So And try to to comment on, on your point, um, and you know I'm trying to be uh, cautious. You know, saying a word of cautious, where we now focusing on DNA methylation, and we've talked about uh, histone methylation a bit, and on modification. I think we are in fact still at the 0.1 percent of understanding the complex networks, and epigenetics is not just simply DNA. And it's just there is RNA on it, there are prions and, uh, or aggregates and proteins that actually can be inherited to subsequent generation. And so it will need a lot of basic research still to understand what's going on um, until we can try and model probable uh, disease perceptions uh, much better. It's, I would like to compare it a bit like the weather forecast, which a while ago, you know, people looked at the sky and said, well, it's going to rain tomorrow or not. And now we're getting better and better by just modeling and better and better. And the same or similar things will happen to epigenetics. What I found, just one short remark, really, in, in your book, you, if you read it, you think like, oh, there are so many things you can maybe explain with epigenetics up to astrology, right? I mean, so you had this one chapter where you said, oh, the, the date of... Um, conception actually is very important to you know your how you outcome and your behavior and I thought well you know that's astrology and uh, I'm, I'm wondering whether you would go that far and say you know here hey the willpower uh, or the placebo effect could actually be due to epigenetic changes or uh, what, what your comment would be on that I think you just give me the title of my next new book I think that's what it <laughs> You know, the astrology miracle, that would be the sort of, you know, combine them all in one book, as a diet, astrology, and, uh, and sex, and you've got everything. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I, I think, my point is, I think we have to keep an open mind on these things, and, and it's really uh, changing our, our rather fixed views of what is and isn't possible. And as you said, we understand only a small part of it, but I think by understanding one part of it, we can see the possibilities and I think that's what you were alluding to, that just by saying that it's possible that we can, you know, by something our, our grandparents did can influence us in ways we hadn't thought of means that it's an exciting moment in science when we realize that all these other mechanisms could be acting in some, in ways which are very sort of lateral thinking that we just hadn't grasped with our rather conventional narrow view of science. And I think that's, that's the really exciting part. 
So I don't think nothing's really off the off limits. And uh, but I, I'll, I'll work on the astrology book. I know it's going to be a bestseller. Sisan, <laughs> you get the last. Uh... Uh, uh, I, I think just by listening to you and reading the book, I really recognize how much the language has changed during the last three years. Because previously we were talking about having the sequence done. That was a lifetime investment. But now you pointed out that we needed to, to see the diversity, how we change. You said multiple times, for instance, during a slimming period, that you would like to check up and see how we were improving genetic or epigenetic wise. And I think that simply by listening to you, I think it has great consequences also because uh, uh, for how we, we would proceed in science. Because uh, this means that we will have multiple sequences and procedures done. We will also relate very differently to the biobanks. They need to be, have many time points. It's not just one simple one, we, we will simply have to organize this because otherwise we will end up, the Oslo being filled up with samples. So, so that we have in some way to relate to this dynamic way of looking at our genome and also the environment, how do we measure these environmental issues. So I think it has been a very exciting day. Absolutely. And by this, I think we wish to round up. We wish to thank you all for be coming here today. I hope you learned a bit more about epigenetics uh, be uh, now as before you enter the door. And we would like to affect your fat genes uh, on your way home and present you with a bit of chocolate uh, as a token of thank you for being here today and uh, giving Tim a hard time with many questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.